19. They had left him unable to move, but at least able to walk. Kentrell saw no reason to remain silent. Tsin, snap out of it! Can't you see how wrong everything about this is? You're under a spell yourself, damn it! Do relax, Duman, chided the Vajerai. Such an ungrateful cretin you are. Immortality, riches, power. I thought that was what the mercenary dreamed of. It was no use. Quoth Tsin could not see past whatever had been cast upon him. Lord Khan had preyed upon the sorcerer's greed, just as the captain himself had when first instigating Tsin to persuade their host to make Yure part of the mortal world again. Or had their host needed any convincing? It had been Atana who had first broached the subject with Kentrill, telling him that they could be together if her father did not decide to try once more to follow the path to heaven. The mercenary realized that he had been duped. Juris Khan had no doubt sent his daughter to fill the gullible captain's head with such notions, knowing that Kentrill would do his utmost to sway the Vajerai. Both he and Tsin had been played like puppets, or worse, fish on a line. Bait had been set to catch each, then the Lord of Yure had reeled them in with ease. It's quite ironic, commented the elder monarch. I had only just sent my darling daughter to find you, when you apparently came looking for her. I had meant to wait longer to cast this spell, but my children were so eager, so hungry, that I was forced to move the spell to this night. Kantril looked at Sin to see if he heard any of what their host had just confessed, but the short, balding sorcerer seemed quite contented preparing for the task at hand. The Vajerai had begun to go around the edge of the platform, using mumbled spells to cause various runes to glow brighter. Whatever hold Juris Khan had over the sorcerer looked to be very complete indeed. I had promised them your men when first we noticed your arrival, but I needed one of you for this precious work. I also needed another wielder of sorcery to aid in my effort the others having been necessarily sacrificed to my sacred mission long ago. Gregus Matsi never tried to destroy Yure, did he? The regal lord looked offended. He did worse than that. He dared claim that I knew not what I did. Claim that I, Juris Khan, loving lord of all my subjects, damned rather than saved my people. Can you believe such audacity? Captain Dumont could believe that and much more about his captor. He saw now what he and the rest had so blindly missed. Yurei's master had gone completely insane, his desire for good somewhat twisted into all of this. I admit, there were times when my beliefs faltered, but whenever that happened, the archangel would appear to me, bolster my will, and once more set me on the proper course. Without his guidance, it's possible I wouldn't have pressed on to the end. The archangel Juris Khan constantly spoke of had to have been a product of his own mind. And yet, here stood the man who nearly succeeded in reaching the sanctuary of heaven. How could the archangel have been delusioned then? Only with the efforts of such a one could any mortal possibly have hoped to accomplish so incredible a feat. He warned me of the insidious efforts of the dark powers to influence those around me, that I could not trust any but myself. Even those who worked in concert, to bring success to our goal, might have become tainted. Khan wore an expression of intense pride. And so, I cleverly planned to make certain that none of them would have the opportunity to betray me at the moment of our destiny. When the priest and spellcaster had gathered to do their part, they had not realized that their master had something else in mind, in addition to their work. Devised in secret, Yurei's monarch had instituted a second spell, one so enmeshed in the principal effort that none of his underlings would take notice of it. Each would unknowingly assist in ensuring that there would be no attempt to usurp the holy quest. Juris Khan had laid within the master spell a means by which to slay each and every one of those who aided him. Their fates had been decided the moment they had begun. The spell that had sought to cast Yurei to heaven 
had not only drawn from the innate magical powers of the world, but had also done so with equal force from the casters themselves. It had all been so well planned, down to the most delicate of details, Cantrell's captor went on. I could feel Yurei's soul being lifted from its earthly shell, and the life forces of the corrupted ones being leached from their treacherous selves. But he had underestimated one among them, the one he should have most watched, Gregus Matsi, trusted confidant and nearly son to the elder ruler, a sorcerer acknowledgeable and skilled. Along with the priest Abayo, Matsi had been the one who had most contributed to the breakthrough needed to make the great spell possible in the first place. I saw it in his eyes. I saw the moment when he comprehended what the spell sought to do to him. He didn't realize that I had done the altering, but he knew nonetheless the result. At the most crucial moment, at the most critical juncture, Gregus tore himself free from the matrix we had all created. With his remaining power, he cast himself out of Yure. The instinctive reaction had done more than save Mozi. It had also created an imbalance that had ripped the soul of Yurei free from the mortal plane, but, instead of sending the realm to heaven, had left it in a shadowed, timeless limbo. With the aid of the rest of the kingdom's sorcerers and priests, Juris Khan might have been able to correct the matter and complete the quest for holy sanctuary, but his spell had done to them what it had failed to do to Gregus Mozi. The one exception proved to be Tobio, whom Providence had saved virtually unscathed. Lord Khan had decided that this had meant the priest had been chosen to live, and it pleased the monarch to know that one old friend of his had remained true. With Tobio, Khan had immediately worked to find freedom for their endless prison, but all plans had failed. The people had begun to panic, to fear that they would be trapped forever. Juris Khan raised the dagger over Kentrill as he talked, drawing invisible patterns. And then, when our hour was darkest, he added with a grateful smile. The archangel came to me in my dreams again. As you already know, he could not alter what had happened, but he could at least guide, and more important, assist me in fulfilling my people's destiny. The heavenly one showed me how to open a door of sorts, let his power flood into me, let his wishes and mine mingle, and from there touch my children. However, when he found out about this new gift, Tobio had proven to be a most jealous priest, at least in Khan's eyes. He had confronted his old friend, had claimed him to be not the recipient of holy powers, but tainted by infernal ones. The priest had even had the audacity to attempt to restrain his lord, but Juris Khan had easily overwhelmed the misguided clergyman. With saddened heart, he cast Tobio into the ancient dungeons below, hoping that some day the priest would shake off the sinful thoughts and return to the fold. Unhindered now, Lord Khan had acted upon the archangel's dictates, creating spells that would help preserve his precious children while he sought a more permanent remedy. The archangel showed him how to keep the people calm, how to open up each to the subtle ministrations of other angels, one for each person. He had Yure's trusting ruler bring into the fold his own daughter, reveal to her the glory of the archangel and the gifts she would gain by helping her father and the people. Pulling back the dagger from over Captain Dumont's chest, Juris Khan extended one arm to Atana. The crimson tressed princess came to her father, letting him envelop her in that arm. Atana gave Kentrill a loving, knowing smile, one filled with the certainty of the righteousness of her sire's cause. She was scared, my good captain, scared because she did not understand the blessing he forced to give her. The weathered but noble face beamed down at his loving offspring. I had to be forceful. I had to insist, despite her unwillingness. It took much perseverance, even on the part of the archangel, but at last she opened herself up to him. Atana wore an enraptured expression. It was so childish, my love. I actually feared what father wanted. When the archangel entered me, I actually screamed. Can you believe it? It all seems so silly now. To the captive mercenary, who had seen what such a blessing had created of Atana and her father, 
it hardly seemed silly at all. Whatever their angelic benefactor had sought to accomplish, it had resulted in an abomination of everything holy. I believe I'm nearly ready, my lord, quoth Sin suddenly announced. There are but a few minor patterns to cast. I'm gratified, master sorcerer. Without your effort, this could not come to be. Cantrell chose to use the distraction as a chance again to test the mobility of his body. Unfortunately, even despite the Vajarai's numerous tasks and Lord Khan's horrific reminiscences, the sorcery keeping the captain prisoner had not faltered in the least. Atana came to his side again, rubbing what would have been a soothing hand on his forehead, if not for the fact that she used the same appendage that had earlier been mangled to pulp. The rich emerald eyes gleamed, but did not blink. You'll feel so silly yourself when this is all over, darling Kentrill. You'll wonder, just as I did, why I made so much of a fuss. He could not meet her gaze, not while the memory of how she looked when she entered the chamber still burned harshly in his mind. Instead, the captain glanced past her at Jewish Khan, who seemed to have finished with his tale now and intended to do the same to Kentrill. What did happen to Gregus Mazzi? The pleasant smile on the robed monarch's kindly face became not at all pleasant. I told you of the keys, their making, and our earlier attempt to lock the shadow in place, just as you eventually did for us. I also told you how Gregus Mazzi came again to do the unthinkable, to betray us again. In all this I did not lie, good captain. What I omitted, though, was that he had help in the form of the misguided Tobio. Gregus Mazzi had secretly returned to Yure and had learned of the crystals, just as Lord Khan had previously said. But in the process, he had also come across the still-imprisoned priest. Seizing on Tobio's madness and pretending to believe it, the sorcerer had informed his new ally that they had to remove or destroy the two keys so that the Holy Kingdom could not remain on the mortal plane. It was decided that their chances would be double if each went in search of a separate stone. Then, if only one of them succeeded, Yure would again be cast into limbo. But although he had entered the city unnoticed, Gregus Mazzi did not escape his former master's attention when he sought out the key to Shadow. The sorcerer had almost succeeded in stealing away the crystal, but Lord Khan had managed to catch him in the midst of the act. They did battle, but the traitorous spellcaster did not know of the powerful gifts the archangel had given. Mazzi fell swiftly, and in order to make certain there would be no repeat of such betrayal, Khan transformed him into the sentinel Kentrill and the others had discovered. Before that happened, however, the Lord of Yure had wrung from his former friend the fact that Tobio had already started for the other crystal. You see, my dear captain, the key to light had indeed been set in place by brave martyrs. However, when I learned from Gregus that Tobio had gone to destroy my hopes for our eventual release, I admit I grew furious. Summoning the powers granted to me by the Archangel, I transported myself to the shadowed side of the peak, there to find the misguided priest seeking to wrest the key to light from its anointed place. Khan paused, eyes momentarily closed in what appeared to be a moment of renewed mourning. When he opened them again, he told his prisoner, I still cry for poor Tobio, corrupted by Gregus. His death I could not help. I gave him one good opportunity to see the errors of his way, to break free of the madness and come back with me to Yure. Suddenly Kentrill recalled a grisly discovery he had found all but buried in the cold, hard soil atop sinister Nimir. But he didn't, didn't he? Alas, no. Instead, foolish Tobio tore the key free and stepped back into the first rays of day. I admit I reacted without thought, only aware that he had stolen my children's freedom. The weathered bone Captain Dumont had found had belonged to the determined priest, not one of the so-called volunteers. Uncorrupted, Tobio had been able to step into the sunlight, but it had not saved him from Juris Khan's wrath. Fortunately, the crystal had fallen to where even the Lord of Yure could not reach it. The madness that had consumed the Shadowed Kingdom had been kept in check. That is, until Kentrill and his men had come along. 
Even if the good Tobio had failed, I admit I would have still required the aid of a worthy sorcerer such as our friend Quov Tsin here, concluded Atana's father. But that would have been so much easier with a kingdom set in place, not resurrecting only once a day or two every few years. The smile returned. But come, time is fast approaching, and I've likely bored you with so much talk of the past. Now we must prepare for the future, when my people, my children, enlightened by the angels and no longer fearful of the sun, can go out into the world of men and spread the archangel's words to others. But Kentrell had seen those children, the ghoulish creatures that even now fill the city. The ghostly forms he and the others had first witnessed had been illusions to mask an even greater horror. Khan had played on the sympathies of the mercenary officer, and because of it, Captain Dumont had sent most of his men to terrible, monstrous deaths. The vision he had seen twice had been no delusion caused by a thief's drug, no bite from a savage insect. It had been the truth, the reality of Yure. The Holy Kingdom, the light among lights, had been transformed into something diabolic, demonic. All the time, Juris Khan had been manipulating him, preparing the way so that his horrific subjects could spread beyond the confines of the shadow, spread throughout the mortal lands. Yet all the time his capture spoke of the wondrous archangel, the heavenly figure who had come to guide him and his flock to the ultimate sanctuary. Again Kentrell wondered how everything had turned out so horribly. When had the archangel's word become twisted or usurped? Or had there even been an archangel in the first place? Lord Khan had already taken his place, Atana and Quoth Tsin following suit. The towering monarch raised the dagger and opened his mouth. My lord, blurted Cantrill, one last question, to ease my mind and enable me to accept this glory you offer. May I, may I see what this wondrous archangel looked like? The Vajerai, obviously eager to continue, only snorted at this abrupt question, but Juris Khan accepted it with pleasure, clearly believing that the fighter sought to understand. Why, bless you, Cantrill Dumont! If it makes all the difference, I can try to show you. You must know, of course, that I draw from memory, and so what you see, however magnificent, is but a dim human representation of a being perfect in all manner. In truth, even I never saw him fully, for what mortal could stand the blinding glory of one of heaven's guardians? Giving the blade to his daughter, he held his hands up high and muttered a spell. Cantrell tensed more, although he could not be certain exactly why. Cantrell would only be summoning a representation of the Archangel, not the true being. The mercenary could hardly expect any aid from an illusion. Behold! Juris Khan called, indicating an area well above the platform. Behold! A warrior of truth! A guardian of the bastion of light! A sentinel of goodness watching over all! Behold, the archangel Mirocadus, the golden hair defender of mankind. Behold, Mirocadus, he who has protected Yure from the evils seeking its soul. And as his words echoed throughout the chamber, a figure formed for all of them to see. Atana let out a raptured gasp, and even the jaded sin fell to one knee in homage. Juris Khan himself had tears in his eyes and he mouthed silent thanks to the image of the one he had called his people's greatest protector. Kentrill stared in awe too, clad in glorious armor of the brightest platinum, intricate runes and sculptured glyphs decorating his breastplate. The tall angelic form glowed as brightly as the sun. One arm held in it a flaming sword, the other reached out to the onlooker as if beckoning him to come nearer. From the archangel's shoulders radiated a display of crackling, writhing tendrils of pure magical energy that in their continued frenzy created the illusion of massive fiery wings. The carved image that the mercenary had grown up around had always depicted the angels as hooded, faceless beings, but not so this one. The hood had been thrown back, revealing a visage of perfection surrounded by cascading golden hair. Captain Dumont at first felt some guilt, or even gazing upon the heavenly features of Mirocadus, as if somehow the mercenary 
had not yet proven himself worthy to do such a thing. The broad jaw, the heroic cheekbones, the impossibly commanding visage. Cantrell could never quite make out the specifics of any feature, but the overall impression left him momentarily speechless. No human being could ever hope to match such beauty, such perfection. Lord Khan had only managed to catch an earthly indication of Mirocadus, but even that proved enough to overwhelm the senses. And then Kentrill looked into the eyes and felt his awe suddenly supplanted by an entirely different sensation. The eyes drew him in, snared him. He could not identify their color, only that they were dark, darker even than the most perfect black. Like a horrific vortex, Cantrell Dumont felt as if Mirocadus drew in his very soul, pulled it into some bottomless pit. The urge to scream arose, yet at the same time the vision the mercenary beheld kept him in silent fear. An unreasonable panic such as Cantrell had never suffered shook him. He wanted to rip his gaze away, but the eyes would not permit him that escape. The captain felt himself dragged deeper and deeper into the archangel's eyes, deeper and deeper into a horror impossible to define, yet in some way innately familiar. His skin tore from his flesh, and his bones danced free. Cantrell felt the death of the grave, and the unending torment of the damned soul. Something within, some desperate push for sanity, for hope, at last enabled the fighter to tear his eyes from the figure above. As his mind slowly pieced itself together, Cantrell tried to come to grips with what he had witnessed. Outwardly a messenger, a guardian of heaven, but within, recognized perhaps even by the subconscious of Juris Khan, a thing that could not in any manner be associated with the archangels or their realm. Behind a facade that no one else seemed to see past, Captain Dumont had recognized a monstrous force, a thing of pure evil. And in his mind, Kentrell could only imagine one creature, one being, who could invoke such fear, such terror. The name thrust itself unbidden from the hearty fighter as he sought futilely to push himself away from Lord Khan's illusion. Diablo. Yes, his captor said, with an enthralled smile, seemingly ignorant of what Kendrill had cried. Miracodas, in as much of his glory as an earthly mind can comprehend. The image suddenly vanished, as Juris Khan clasped his hands together in outright pleasure, his smile now turned toward the still dumbfounded soldier. And now that I've showed you the wondrous truth, shall we begin? Zail studied the chamber he and Gorst had so desperately sought to reach, the chamber where the necromancer had felt with complete certainty that Captain Dumont would be found. He stepped toward the center, all but unmindful of the massive, rune-covered platform as he tried to fathom what had gone wrong. Where is he? asked the huge mercenary, eyes shifting warily from one part of the chamber to the other. You said he'd be in here. He should be. Zael consulted the spell again, but the results came up the same. Everything pointed to this being the captain's whereabouts. Yet, quite clearly, it was not. He put away the medallion, trying to see what the dagger itself might reveal. Unfortunately, a full sweep indicated nothing. Gorst wandered around, peering at every corner no matter how unlikely. Think there's another door somewhere? Possible but not likely. Could he be below or above us? An astute question from the giant, but the necromancer had worked to focus his search spell in order to avoid the error. According to his results, their companion should have been right before them. Shutting his eyes briefly, Zai let his senses expand beyond his body. He suddenly became much more aware of the fearsome and wild powers at play, and the fact that they almost gathered near the stone platform just before him. You notice something? Gorst asked hopefully. Nothing that clears up the question of what went wrong. I feel certain that he is supposed to be here. The gargantuan fighter mulled this over for several seconds, then suggested. Maybe Humbard could help. A suggestion Zail should have thought of himself. The skull had proven without a doubt its value yet the necromancer ever hesitated. Zayu's instructors had always taught him the importance of independence, but, 
when a tool such as Humbart Westel worked, why not make the best of it? He pulled the last bit of mortal remains of the older mercenary from the new pouch and showed Humbart the chamber. The skull made small, thoughtful sounds, but did not otherwise speak as his wielder let him view everything. I can't see hide or hear of him, Humbart announced when they had finished. A real puzzle, that. You see nothing? Oh, I see a lot. I see a damned hodgepodge of colors and lines and other shapes and forms, all swirling madcap around that big block of stone there. I see just about every rune on that thing glowing like lightning. I see enough signs of raw, earthly and unearthly energy wrapping itself about that thing to make me wish I had feet again so I could hightail it out of here. But I don't see Captain Dumont anywhere. The necromancer grimaced. Then my spell went awry after all. Despite my best efforts, it sent us in the wrong direction. It happens to everyone, lad. Maybe if you tried again. I have tried enough. The results would be the same, I promise you. This did not please Gorst at all. But we can't give up on him. The behemoth roared, slamming a fist on the nearest table and nearly upsetting an entire shelf of specimens nearby. I can't. Easy, boy snapped Humbart. Fearing the giant's growing rage might end up recreating Zayo's own near disaster in Gregor Smotsi's sanctum, the spellcaster quickly said, No one is giving up, Gorst. We simply need to think this through. Something is wrong here. Something that I must consider carefully. Somewhat mollified, the mercenary quieted. Zayel only hoped that he could live up to his words. He studied the various parts of the sanctum again, trying to find anything amiss. He stared at the shelves, the tables, the stone platform, the jars full of... Humbart, tell me once more what you see when you stare at the platform. The skull did, recounting the furious forces and the glaringly bright and vivid runes. He told of the swirling energy, wild and monstrous, gathered over it. Humbart Wessel described the virtual maelstrom of sorcerer's powers at play, above and as a part of the stone structure. I don't see any of that, Gorst commented when the skull had finished. Nor did the necromancer, and that interested him very much. He could sense them, yes, but not see them as Humbart did. And from the skull's vivid description, it sounded as if the forces at play grew more alive, more violent, with each passing moment. They had to be building up to something, something Zail could only imagine very terrifying. Returning Humbart to the pouch, the necromancer stepped up to the platform. Although he saw no life in the various runes, the feeling that they had been brought into play remained with him, so much so that when Zail ran his fingers over several, he could swear he felt them pulsating. What is it? Gorst asked. I do not know, but I must try something. Inspecting the runes, Zayel touched three he recognized for their power. He muttered a spell under his breath, creating ties between himself and those runes. Raw forces charged through the system, causing the necromancer to gasp. The giant started toward him, but Zail shook his head. Still struggling to keep the forces in balance, the spellcaster drew forth his dagger. The blade gleamed bright, and as he held the weapon over the platform, a rainbow of colors arose from various markings etched in the stone, creating an almost blindingly display of power. Let the truth be known, Zayel shouted to the ceiling. Let the mask fall away. Let the world be shown as it is. Our eyes uncovered at last. Suddenly the necromancer felt a sense of displacement, so great that he could not maintain his link. He fell back, his eyes seeming to lose all focus. He saw the entire chamber doubled, and yet also very different. While one version held Zail and Gorst, the other revealed a different, barely visible scene with three figures standing very near him. As Zail stepped further back, Gorst came forward. I see him! I see! He got no further. The room, all sense of reality, shifted again for the pair. The giant fell to one knee, and it was all the necromancer could do not to do the same. The other version of their surroundings began to fade. Zail struggled forward again, determined not to lose it. The vaguely seen figures did not even notice what happened around them. They appeared engrossed in something concerning the platform. 
One of them looked like Juris Khan, and another had hair the color of his daughter's. The shortest of the three put Zail in mind of the Vijerai, although what Kuov Tsin would be doing here he could not say. Planting his hands on two of the runes, Zail barked out his spell anew. He summoned the forces to him. Something else sought to draw them away, but the necromancer persisted, certain that if he did not, it would end in disaster. Again, everything shifted. The two variations moved closer into sync. A fourth form coalesced on the platform, his arms and legs spread as if bound. The startling addition almost caused Zayil to lose his concentration a second time. Everything began to fade again, but he managed to keep it from disappearing altogether. For a third time, Zayil shouted the words of power while he demanded that the forces inherent in the runes obey his dictates. The figure trapped on the platform came into focus. Zayil recognized Kentril Dumon, who did not yet see him. In fact, the captain stared wide-eyed at something above him, his expression so intense that the necromancer had to look himself. Juris Khan loomed over them, eyes wide with anticipation. His hand had just begun a swift plunge toward Captain Dumont's chest, and in that hand a wicked blade sought the mercenary's heart.